Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Guido Holzman. Uh, Guido's lecture is on the division of labor and social order. Guido? Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I am, I'm happy that you don't resent my PowerPoint disaster from yesterday <laughs> evening. So just as to prevent a similar case today, I return back to good old paper, no more PowerPoint. Uh, so our lecture will be uh, on the division of labor and social order, that is the, uh, the title, but in fact it is a part, the, division, the theory of the division of labor is a part of the theory of production. And the point of my lecture is to cover the real aspects of uh, the production processes. What does it make that production can be more or less uh, productive? What are the different uh, basic real strategies that is non-monetary? Real always is compared to, compared to monetary spending. Uh, what are the, the basic real mechanisms through which we can increase the productivity of human labor, so the main source of our wealth. And in subsequent lectures, we will then uh, uh, cover, that is not myself, but my colleagues will cover the monetary aspects. As first, we need to introduce the money and then examine how money prices steer precisely those processes uh, that we are now discuss uh, discussing in general. That is, even that hold true, we are discussing those aspects that hold true universally, even outside of a monetary economy. So we'll proceed in six steps. First, I will discuss with you the nature of production, give, give a definition of production. Then we will uh, discuss the limits of production in the second step. And the limits of production can be summarized under the heading of the law of returns. In the third step, we will raise the question how we can increase human productivity. And there are two main ways to do this. We will discuss these two main ways in steps four and five. And uh, uh, finally, in the sixth step, we will stress the fundamental role of savings. Okay, so what is production? Production is the intentional transformation of nature by human beings. It's a transformation of nature, so if, if I change, uh, it's, it's always a transformation of nature. Any production process does not create something. We are not gods, we are human beings, so we take what we find and we transform this into something else. It's always a transformation process. Now, part of the transformation process, these are not intentional. Um, uh, for example, we are, we are breathing, and it's not our intention to create um, uh, the gases, uh, that result from our, our breathing pr uh, process, at least not in most cases. So this would not be a case of production. But it is a case of production if we set out a road. A road virtually never comes into being by accident. Okay, It's always something that is a planned transformation of an intentional transformation of nature. And uh, so in any case, it is a necessary element of production that it involves human activity, at least some human choice. And we uh, not necessarily extended activity. For example, if we uh, store wine in a cave in order to improve its, its quality so it will last there for two or three years, it doesn't involve constant activity on our part. We just put it into the cave and, and let it mature down there at fairly constant temperature with no light and so on. Uh, this is still a production process because it involves our choice. We made an initial choice to tr store the, the wine there. We could have taken it out or we can take it out at any point of time, so it's always subject to our choice. So production is the principal way through which human beings obtain revenue, through which they obtain the goods that they desire. The other way, the only logically other way, is to um, uh, take those things that we find spontaneously in nature. And even in those cases, strictly speaking, there is some production involved. If I go uh, on the prairie somewhere and I find an apple tree that has been, not been planted by a human being, so it doesn't belong to anybody, it's a home, homeless or an ownerless apple tree, and I, I take an apple, strictly speaking, this is a production process because I transform my environment and I transform nature 
go to the apple tree, pluck the apple. Without my activity, the apple would still hang on the tree, hang on the tree, or would fall to the ground. Now it's in my hand. So it's a very primitive production process. But so we see that in this case, we are benefiting, we are deriving our uh, economic goods, the goods that we desire, uh, from uh, from the environment as it exists without human in- intervention, so environment in its original state. But if we... Uh, so this is, of course, the lifestyle of hunters and, and gatherers, so primitive human lifestyles. They were living off the environment. We're not transforming it intentionally. This is, of course, what we do today, and this is the most productive way of creating additional goods. We transform our environment intentionally in order to create much more economic goods than nature would give us all by herself. So then the question is, what limits uh, our productive abilities here? What limits our productivity? What limits the productivity of human labor? This is the central question in the theory of production. Because there are, of course, various other Factors of production that we use, right? There are land resources, raw materials, uh, and uh, 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 the, the, the air that we breathe, so there's oxygen that is there spontaneously, and so on. Uh, but most of the things we produce, we have to produce ourselves. So, what limits our productivity? We summarize. Uh, this under the heading of the law of returns. What the law of returns says is that because of the limitation involved in any factor of production, in particular also in, in human labor, the output that I can create within any uh, period, an hour, a day, a year, etc., is limited. There is some absolute limitation beyond which I cannot go. Given all circumstances as they are. And the way we illustrate this, usually in economics, is with a, is with a graph. So I'll give you this graph. So we have here a, a mathematical, logical is- illustration and a graphical illustration. I just see uh, uh, up here uh, a uh, uh, logical representation of the production processes process, it involves three factors of production, X, Y, and Z. So we have here a conjunction of the three factors, X and Y and Z, and it gives us a product, Q. Now, the graph, what the graph represents is the way the output, Q, changes as we vary the impact, as we vary the the quantity of one of these factors of production, X. So we hold y and z constant, and we vary x. Now, an example. Uh, we are uh, planting wheat. So we have several factors of production. We have human labor. could be our x. In most textbooks, that's usually it's the x. Right? Uh, and then we have uh, land, so it's a, uh, the surface that we, that we work, and then we have some uh, fertilizer. Okay. And then, of course, there are others too, right? You need some sunshine after all. You need water and so on. I didn't include this here. So let's say we have these three factors. Now you hold the surface constant. You always use the same quantity of fertilizer, and you increase the quantity of labor. Then we can increase the output as we go on, but only up to a certain limit, beyond which... It, it is not possible to do this beyond which we will actually have a diminished uh, return on, uh, our, on, on the use of this factor of production. And the reason uh, this is so is that the, the other factors that we hold constant render limited services. A certain amount, whatever, uh, one ton of fertilizer uh, renders only so and so many services. Right? Can, certain impact on, uh, on growth processes, but, I mean, one ton only has this and that impact. One hectare of land only has uh, this and that impact, uh, helps only grow so and so much wheat, not more. So the reason why the impact of our human labor here is limited is because the other factors of production do not vary and render limited services. And it's the same way if we 
uh, change the roles if our X here would be, for example, fertilizer, and we hold the surface of uh, the area that we work constant, and also the quantity of fertilizer, excuse me, the, uh, the quantity of, uh, of work. Uh, so it's always the same man hours, always the same surface, one hectare. Now we're increasing the fertilizer. To some extent, it will help us increase our production. But as from some point, right, imagine just we're, we're uh, uh, covering all of the, the surface with fertilizer, uh, 10 inches high. Uh, this will not facilitate the growth process, okay, right? So then it actually diminishes. And so, again, the reason is, the reason why the fertilizer has a limited impact is because the other factors do not vary. It's the other factors that remain constant that limit the impact of the varying factor and whatever the roles are. So this is the law of return. The law of returns, and again, the, the, ba the, the basic, the essential meaning of the law of returns is that there is some upper lim limit beyond which we cannot go given uh, by, by varying the impact of any one factor, given if the other factors of production do not vary. So the question then is, if this is so, how is, have we ever been able to get out of poverty? Our ancestors in remote times have been living in abject poverty, and by today's standards, the standards that we are used to under the impact of the Industrial Revolution, which is still ongoing, uh, are incomparably higher than the living standards of our ancestors even living in the 18th century. So how, why have we been able to get beyond this? Because this is obviously what has happened. And we've been able to get beyond this barrier. And uh, the, uh, the way to do this, there, there are well, basically two ways to do this. In any case, two ways to do this that I will discuss with you this afternoon. Uh, these are savings investments on the one hand and the division of labor on the other hand. So you see that you know, the division of labor is, is part of this overall picture. as the, the title of my lecture, but it's part of an overall picture. So we need to grasp the overall picture. The division of labor helps us to get beyond this barrier. Savings investment help us also to go beyond this barrier. So what happens here, and I will illustrate this later, is this. So what we'll do now is to turn first to savings investment, which creates something that we call, that Austrian economists call roundabout production. And then we will turn to the division of labor. So roundabout production allows us to go beyond this by shifting this curve upwards. So there's still a limitation, but it's now at a higher level. And so the law of return still holds, but it holds at a higher level. How is this possible? Well, we do this by increasing the quantities of the other factors of production. That is, we have here now an, a Y2 and a Z2 that are still constant, <coughs> but at a higher level. Right? We're cultivating a greater surface of, of land. We're using more fertilizer. So with the same amount of labor, we can now produce more wheat. And we're shifting simply our curve upward. Most notably, what we are doing, well, so this would be the uh, one possibility how this could happen. Another possibility is... Um, to substitute natural forces for human labor. We are creating tools that do human labor instead of human beings themselves. For example, we are creating a machine that packages bottles or that uh, uh, pumps air into uh, tires and so on. So in any case, in all these uh, whatever concretely we are doing, in any case, we are always changing the Ys and the Zs. We are always changing the, the other factors of production with which we combine human labor. In the most primitive setting, we are working only with such factors of production as we find in nature spontaneously, that, are, that is, without human intervention. We are working with the land that is, exists there. Uh, 
and with the air that exists spontaneously in nature, etc., etc., then, of course, we can go on and produce more land. For example, we can produce more land by building skyscrapers. And we get more surface because we're going up high. Or we get going down if we are constructing uh, several levels of, of floor down into the ground. For example, the NSA does this. <laughs> well, we are doing it too when we are constructing our cave or something, right? So we create more standing surface, we create more land. We are creating uh, oxygen for the operation of submarines, and for other things. And so in, in such cases, we produce more of the factor of production that we need in excess of the quantities that are available spontaneously in nature. It's always the same principle. But what this means is that we need time to do this. Human action is stretched out in time. So we can no longer dedicate all of our time or as much of our time to consumption or to the production of consumer goods as we have done before. Now we need to take out part of our time budget and dedicate it to the production of producer goods, to the production of factors of production. Let's take, for example, the uh, classic example of the fisherman. Example, that is, I believe it's used by Wim Barwerk, and he has taken it over from Karl Knies, was a German economist in the 19th century, so staying within the German tradition. The fisherman. So the fisherman, he lives happily on the uh, board of, uh, on the, uh, next to a river or on, on the seashore, and he needs one fish per day to survive. Because he has a very good spot, he can fish. Two fishes per day with his bare hands because he's in the most primitive setting, whatever. Two fishes per day with his bare hands. It's not, not bad. I mean, if I tried to do this, it would take me a week and I would have whatever, not even one fish. So, I mean, he's, he's a smart guy and he catches two fish per day with his bare hands. So he needs a day, uh, one fish per day to survive so he can, with uh, the work of one day, survive two days. One day is dedicated to production the production of a consumer goods. The second day is then, can be dedicated to leisure. Right? You can sit there, lay down, look at the skies, watch the clouds, listen to the birds, sing a love song, or, or war eagle song, or something else. <laughs> In other words, he's, uh, he's consuming a consumer's good. But leisure is a consumer good. Right? So he's consuming. One day of work, during which he consumes, and then the second day entirely dedicated to consumption. Now, how can he increase his productivity of labor? Well, by constructing a tool, for example, a net. And he could take some lianes or something that he finds in the woods, uh, some katsu, and, and build a net. And here in, the, here in South Alabama, you would take katsu, it's a Japanese import. You build a net, but in order to construct the net, you need time. So, in order to uh, survive the time needed for the construction of the net, he needs to consume. There is no production without consumption. But of course, this production process, constructing the net, does not yield directly another consumer good. So he needs to produce fish in advance, in advance, and use them then during those days in which he dedicates himself only to constructing the net. So, for example, he would work four days now in a row, no more uh, leisure day, right? No more time taking off, just looking at the skies and so on. Uh, he works four days in a row, eats one fish per day, and at the end of the four days, he has accumulated a stock of four fish. So he can survive with a stock of four fish for more days. Now, my students in Angers are very smart. They always ask me, well, <laughs> but the fish will rot, so it won't help. <laughs> but then comes the smart German professor. Yeah, but he will have a little hole in the ground somewhere which he fills up with water so the fish cannot swim away. <laughs> <laughs> so he will survive the four days. <laughs> Not the fish, but he. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and during the four days, he uh, and after four days, he will then have a net. And with the help of this net, then he can fish a much greater quantity of fish per day. He can f catch whatever, 17 fish per day or 170. Doesn't matter. So an enormous quantity of fish. So what do we learn from this example? Well, the first thing I've already stressed, uh, production needs consumption. There is no such thing as production without consumption. And because this is so, because we need to produce, uh, we, we need to consume in order to be able to engage in production, uh, we need to have some savings. And some of our revenue of the past period must have been set aside to allow us to continue working in the present. And this is always so. It doesn't strike us uh, this, uh, this way because, I mean, we are raised usually in families, so in this case our parents provide the savings that allow us to go to school, right? even while we don't create all the consumer's goods that are needed to uh, keep us alive. And then later on, we, we take over, right? building on the savings that we have built, and that our parents have created in the first place, and that we have set out then ourselves, and we go on producing. So production always needs savings beforehand. The second one, production needs time. That, that's the reason uh, why we need uh, uh, production uh, process, why we need savings in the first place. And we, in order to engage in uh, the production of producer goods, we need to cut the con uh, 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 consumption of consumer goods. And we had to renounce, in, a, in the case of the fisherman, he had to renounce to uh, four days of, of leisure and four days of singing songs, during which he now engaged in the uh, construction of the net. So we can infer from this that there's a, a general rule. It's, in fact, a law of production. The higher are our savings the more lengthier are the production processes in which we can engage. And therefore, the more productive can human labor become. So, of course, no necessity here. Right? It depends on the fact that during the longer production process, we use our time to construct those tools that will really enable us to produce more than before. We might be wrong about this. And here, I took the, the idea of a net that is fairly well known, and maybe our fisherman, he has, in his spare time, right, he has, uh, on his leisure days, he has observed a, a spider, how the spider caught the, the flies, and so on, and said, well, I could do the same thing with the fish. Right? So he thought it was pretty sure that this technology would, would work out. But sometimes we, we try technologies that do not work. And so we have saved, we have then started out to invest, and actually it was a wrong investment. Right? Happens all the time. Uh, but in any case, uh, this doesn't change anything to the general law that we have formulated. The longer the production process, or the, the, the higher our, our savings, the longer can be the production processes, and the more productive, therefore, can become human labor. Uh, this is the law of roundabout production. What are the limits to this process? And we, uh, we could raise the question, well, why don't we do this indefinitely? If we can simply uh, increase our, our wealth simply by saving about more, why don't we do this? Well, the, the first reason is that, of course, we, we need to consume a minimum. We cannot cut down our consumption to zero. It's impossible. Right? Human beings operate under the constraint of the stomach, right? Otherwise, say we are no angels. Right? Angels are completely spiritual beings, and they, they wouldn't need to consume. But on the other hand, there's no need for them to produce either. Right? <laughs> if you don't need to consume, you don't need to produce. So it's, it's a truly human problem to which we are confronted. So we need to consume a minimum, and therefore uh, our savings are limited. There's an absolute limit to our possible savings. The second limit is time preference. Even though we know that we could increase our productivity in the future by cutting on our consumption right now, we might not always want to do this. 
we might actually prefer have a higher consumption now than a higher consumption in the future. There's nothing wrong with this. Economic science doesn't tell us what is the optimal savings rate or something. You should save more or you should save less. But it's just a fact. And people have different opinions about this and different value judgments, have different subjective values. And values are subjective, depend on the individual. So some individuals will live happily with, uh, at a relatively low material level uh, throughout their lives because they enjoy consumption in the present. And others are always looking to increase consumption in the future and are therefore ready to cut down consumption in the present. So we have the principle of the division of, uh, of, uh, of roundabout production, and it entails such, a, such an increase of the limits uh, on our returns. So this is the first step, the first way to increase the productivity of human labor. The second way to do this is through the division of labor, which brings us to our subject, as announced in the title, at least. What is the division of labor? Well, it's the specialization in the production of specific products. It's human cooperation in which, uh, uh, human cooperation between specialists. We can imagine that Robinson Crusoe on his island is producing all the consumer goods that he needs. So he's chasing rabbits and he's picking apples. He's feeding on this healthy diet, meat and apples, meat and fruit. And then arrives uh, Crusoe, uh, Friday. Friday arrives on the island. And now Friday also eats apples and rabbits because actually there's nothing else on this island that could be eaten. So they, and happily, they, they both like uh, apples and rabbits. And so they now can cooperate in producing these two goods. They can specialize. One of them can specialize maybe in the production of uh, apples, and the other one can specialize in the production of rabbits. Now this depends on their relative productivities. We can here distinguish three cases. I would like to discuss with you briefly these three cases. Okay. Let's see. So the first case is the following one. Can you can you see this? Or should I zoom? I ah, know. Yep. Okay, it's okay. So you see here uh, in the, the first two columns are the productivities of Peter and Paul, the two individuals. It's not Crusoe and Friday. I like Peter and Paul for reasons that some might know. Uh, so if, uh, their productivity in apple production and rabbit production, Peter can uh, plug 10 kilograms, sorry for that, uh, of apples per hour. <laughs> Could have popped 10 pounds or something, but yeah, for me it's easier to represent this. And he can chase, uh, not only chase, but actually uh, kill two rabbits per hour. And Paul uh, can pick 15 kilograms of apples per hour and he uh, chases and kills one rabbit per hour. So he produces one dead rabbit per hour, but it's fresh, fresh flesh. Yeah. So if we now, so clearly now, uh, Paul is the better uh, apple uh, picker, and Peter is the better hunter. So there is a division of labor possible between them, right? because they, they can be entirely, uh, they can specialize entirely in that area, in which they are relatively better than their uh, partner. So before the division of labor, right, that's the third col uh, column, before the division of labor, each one of them was dedicating five hours to the production of uh, apples and five hours to, uh, to the hunt. So Peter produced 50 kilograms of apples and hunted to attend rabbits, and Paul produced 75 kilograms of apples and five rabbits. And after the specialization, which Peter specializes on hunting and Paul on apple picking, uh, they 
uh, F different quantities, 20 rabbits are now being killed and 150 kilograms of apples are being uh, picked. So this means that from an aggregate point of view, we have increased the overall product, right? the gross domestic product of our society. So this is our next line, right? So you see this is the, the sum. Before the division of labor, we had 125 kilograms uh, total apple production and 15 total rabbit uh, production, and thereafter 150 kilograms and 20. Uh, so the aggregate product, the gross domestic product of our two people society, has increased. The division of labor is therefore an independent cause of wealth creation. Uh, this is what results from this analysis. Very simple. Uh, we can summarize this by saying that the division of labor is an independent cause of wealth creation. It has nothing to do with the qualities of the individuals per se or of any technology. It's just by cooperating that they create a higher physical output. Now, one might raise the question, uh, uh, what happens if one of the guys is superior to the other in all respects? Is a division of labor possible even then? Uh, so you have the superman on the one hand and the zero on the other hand. China here, France there, as I always say to my, <laughs> to my French students, right? So they are, they are always, I mean, if you, if you just read the mainstream media or the, the business news, sometimes you, I mean, you get crazy, right? Because you think that, yeah, they always, especially in France, have the obsession with representing foreign nations as overwhelmingly powerful and we need to entrust our lives to our government, which alone will save us from these invading powers. So I always bring this up. Okay, so we have uh, China and, and France, or Superman, and the, uh, the complete zero. And uh, is, So is a division of labor possible between them? The, the crucial question is, how could the Superman possibly benefit from the cooperation of the zero guy? Does he, does he need them at all? And indeed, for many centuries, uh, social analysis, analysts have claimed that he wouldn't need them at all. And therefore, if he cooperates with inferior people at all, he's actually rendering them a ser service, right, a gratuity. And the least thing he could expect in return is therefore obedience. Okay? I uh, am friendly enough to help you out, to share my overwhelming productive powers with you, therefore at least you should obey when I tell you to do this or that and go to war in particular. So, we have the, the case too in which we have these different productivities. And what e uh, economists have shown, and uh, the classical economists in particular, most notably David Ricardo, is that even in such a case, we can create a mutually beneficial division of labor. Let's consider so the case too. So Paul is now the superman. Uh, he's not smashing superman, but he's clearly superior, right? For example, Paul could be the, the father of Peter. Right? Peter is maybe 10 years old and Paul is 30 or something. So Paul produces more apples and he hunts more rabbits, kills more rabbits than, than Peter. Can they cooperate? And indeed they can. What is necessary in this case is that, that Peter specializes completely on that area where he is relatively best. Of course, he's not better than than Paul, but where he is not quite as bad as compared to Paul than in the other area. Now, which is this area? Well, it's clearly apple production, because in apple production he is 50% less efficient than Paul, whereas in uh, rabbit production he is twice as inefficient, 100% as inefficient as, uh, as Paul. So he will specialize completely in apple production, and Paul will now keep splitting his time, but dedicate a relatively greater uh, time budget on the production of the other good that is on the hunt and reduce somewhat his apple production. So Paul, in my example here, he will expand his uh, rabbit production from five hours to eight hours. So rather than hunting 20 rabbits, he now hunts uh, 32 rabbits and he reduces his apple production from five hours to two hours. So rather than 75 kilograms, he produces 30 kilograms. 
the result is, again, an increase of the aggregate product. an increase of aggregate product. Now, the implication is that the superman always stands to benefit from the division of labor. He benefits as much as the other guy. So it's not out of uh, friendship or charity or something else that superior people, and superior people always exist, cooperate with inferior people, inferior in certain regards, It is out of their self-interest. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is then the key to the economic explanation of the origin of society. People cooperate because they stand to benefit from cooperation. Even if they are, if the cooperation occurs between superiors and inferiors. It's not out of charity. That is, at least not only out of charity, it's also out of self-interest. Even if the two partners did have no feelings of sympathy to one another, no feelings of love, if they hated one another, they still would have a material incentive to cooperate. It's a very powerful realization. So people have a material incentive to keep the peace and to look for possibilities to cooperate with other people independent of what their emotional feelings toward these other people are. This is a wonderful feature of the world in which we live, and because it's a force that is natural, cannot be um, uh, suppressed, is universal, and pushes people to peace and cooperation. What are the conditions under which this result obtains? There is one essential condition, namely inequality of the partners. And we can see this condition if we analyze a case in which they are perfectly equal. So we have here case three. In this case, Peter and Paul are clones. Twins or whatever, even more than twins, because twins, they get different in the course of time, right? So if One gets specialists in music and the other one in whatever, wheat planting. But here they're completely equal. It's really clones and they remain so. Same productivity in apple production, same productivity on the hunt. Now, and I've taken you one example how you can uh, divide the specialization between them, but you can take any other uh, combination, just make it out for yourself, it's easy to see that they cannot possibly increase the overall physical product of their activities. Impossible. It always stays the same. It's always the damn same same 100 kilograms of apples and always the same 20 rabbits. Year in, year out, or day in, day out. Okay? It doesn't increase. Now, this, again, uh, is very important. It runs counter, of course, to uh, our popular uh, egalitarian Uh, preconceptions, political preconceptions of our time, namely that somehow greater equality is good. What this analysis shows is that greater equality tends to destroy society because it tends to destroy the material incentives for cooperation. To the extent that you make people exactly equal, that they're only clones, you really need a great amount of love, charity, and so on, in order to remain peaceful and uh, not hit the other guy on the head and and rob him, because this then is the only way to enrich yourself above uh, what you had before. So the division of labor creates wealth to the extent that it takes place between unequal partners. This is a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition, because they, they might still choose a wrong specialization. For example, in our case, too, right? Uh, if, if Paul, uh, who is the superman in case two, if he completely specialized, let's say, in hunting, they would not necessarily get a greater overall 
uh, product. Right? You would, they would get a greater overall product as far as rebels, uh, rabbits is concerned, but the apple production would, would diminish. So it's not clear in that case that the overall product uh, would increase. Right? But in any case, so it's a necessary condition. People need to be unequal. And what the division of labor does then is to allow people to enable them to exploit their differences. Right? They... benefit from the fact that they, they are unequal. Okay, so now we have these two basic mechanisms, roundabout production and the division of labor. And roundabout production, as we have seen, is, uh, is based on savings. But savings, the importance of savings goes uh, far beyond roundabout production. It also covers the division of labor. And this is something that, we will, uh, that I will discuss now. This is my, my last and sixth point the fundamental role of savings. So savings increase the productivity of human labor in three different ways. Three different but related ways. The first one is, as we have seen, roundaboutness. The more we save, the longer can be the production process. Therefore, the higher can be, the more tools we can create and so on that substitute for human labor. Therefore, the more productive we become. But roundabout production, for the same reason, also tends to increase the division of labor. Think again of our example of the fisherman. <clears throat> the fisherman moves, if he chooses to construct his net, from a very primitive way of fish produ uh, fishing, I mean fishing with his bare hands, to a more uh, developed way, roundabout way, in which he first produces a net and then, uh, with the net, fishes the fish. Then, of course, he can extend this roundaboutness. For example, he can save even more, and then he can uh, produce a needle, which will facilitate his production of the net. Right? And in order to construct the needle, he can, in the next step, then uh, construct whatever, uh, a hammer or something else that will facilitate the construction of needles. Right? So he can go on and on and on. Now, if he is all alone, then he would have to dedicate his time to the different stages of this production process. He would have to spend a few days on hammer production, a few days on needle production, a few days on net production, and a few days on fishing. But of course, within society, the same basic production process is liable to be subject to the division of labor. Some people can specialize entirely in fishing. Some people can specialize entirely on net making. Other people can specialize in needle making. And even more people, can, other people can specialize in hammer making and so on. Now, but clearly, this division of labor is possible only because we have these savings. If there weren't these savings, if we only had enough savings to engage in very primitive production, then everybody would have to become a specialist in fishing. So no exploitation of the differences. Some guys are better at fishing, other guys are worse at fishing. That's it, end of story. It's only because we have a greater amount of savings and we can lengthen our production process that more possibilities become available for people to become specialists. So without savings, we cannot fully exploit the differences between individuals. It would be impossible to become a computer specialist, for example. It would be terrible news for our current geeks. The third way through which savings increase the productivity of uh, human labor is by their pod positive impact on technology. As a factor about which we have not yet talked so far, but so technology is a, so the, the uh, ensemble uh, of uh, ideas concerning the relationship between the ends that we want to attain and the means that we can use. Right? Well, that's technology. There are different ways of producing a car, right? different technologies. There are different ways to produce a cake, to bake a cake, different technologies. Now, savings benefit 
technological progress in two ways. First of all, without savings, the only technological progress that we uh, would have is the one that comes to us spontaneously, or, so to say, by divine inspiration. Right? We would be constantly ab uh, be absorbed by some production process, either by fishing or by tool making and so on, and then we would have to count on or uh, hope that in some minute or some second would be a sudden glimpse of light and we see an, another idea that we could apply uh, in our production process. What savings allow us to do is to uh, consecrate time entirely to the production of ideas. When I gave you the example of the fisherman, I said that uh, our Robinson, or whoever he is, uh, he had the idea of net making during one of his leisure days when he looked at a spider net. If he is constantly absorbed by fishing, or, uh, he wouldn't have time to look at spider nets. Right? So it's only thanks to savings, thanks to the leisure, uh, that we can, of course, spend only with beer drinking or binge drinking and so on is one possibility, but which we can also use to contemplate our environment, to learn more about the environment, that we develop new ideas and so all R&D departments in companies are financed out of savings. And that part of the revenue, of the past revenue of the company that is not used now uh, for consumptive pro uh, purposes or for the uh, purchase of other factors of production. Universities are paid out of savings. There's some technological progress that comes out of universities, not too much. Yeah. But it's, in any case, it's that what comes out of them is due to savings exclusively. The second way in which uh, savings benefit technological progress is by uh, giving us the time to realize these new ideas. Because ideas do not spring into practice fully fledged. And it's not because we have the idea of a net that it jumps into existence. We need to make the net. And so we need, again, savings to apply technological knowledge. So savings are absolutely fundamental. It's, uh, Austrian economists, therefore, uh, endorse fully the, the program of the classical economists, and of Adam Smith in particular, who have seen in, in savings the mainspring of uh, parsimony, as Adam Smith said, frugality, the mainspring of material progress. So these are the the real mechanisms of economic growth. Right? Uh, and the, the basic problem is always uh, the limitation of productivity, limitation that we call by the name of the law of returns. There's always a maximum limit to the impact of any other factor, of, of any one factor, if the other factors do not vary in quantity. And we can increase this limitation essentially through roundabout production, and through the division of labor. And in this whole process, the uh, savings play a central role. What needs to be seen now, uh, what I've not presented in my lecture, is how the same basic process, increasing the length of production, increasing the division of labor, is uh, organized within a monetary economy. And what we uh, Austrian economists stress here is that this whole process is... Uh, it's basically the same, but it is directed uh, through the prices, uh, the pricing mechanism. So it's market prices that direct entrepreneurial activity into those areas which become possible thanks to increased savings, um, into those no new specializations that become possible through to increased savings and to changes of the preferences of consumers. That was it as far as my lecture is concerned. I think we have a few minutes. For questions. Any questions? Um, you say that uh, innovation can come about from having more time to think about things. Yes. Um, can it also come about from just doing our job a lot? And yeah. Realizing yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Right. So this is something I would say that occurs is a spontaneous. Um, innovation, right? spontaneous technological progress. But even then, right, you cannot be completely absorbed by the, 
the manual gestures and so on. So you need to have some time to stand back. And even if it's just an hour before you fall asleep, tired in your bed and so on, right? You need to have some time to think about this. Mm. Which one? <laughs> I, I talked about uh, technological progress, the fundamental role of savings. The summary. Well, uh, I said something that I said also in the introduction, where I said that in my lecture I cover only the real mechanisms, so those that do not depend on any monetary factors. Okay. With? Price and entrepreneurial activity? Well, the, the division of labor can be organized in different ways. Right? For example, uh, fundamentally we can distinguish between violent and voluntary ways of organizing the division of labor. Now we'll leave aside all the violent ways, right? You have the one guy with the big stick and he's hitting the others on there and said, you are doing this, you are doing this, and so on. Uh, violent guys can be also can be a collective and so on. We leave this aside. But even if we think of purely voluntary ways, right? We can imagine, uh, in particular, that all decisions are being taken by the collective of all producers simultaneously. So they gather into a, a council and make production decisions together. Second possibility is we have uh, decision making by delegation. We have some guys who are making the decisions for everybody else. In extremis, only one guy or, or one, uh, one girl who makes the decision for everybody else. Right? It seems to be uh, ludicrous to, uh, that this could take place voluntarily, but I mean, uh, it's, it's actually true, right? Because the closest case that I've ever encountered in practice are the Moonies. Does anybody know what the Moonies are? It's, it's a sect, right? It's a sect. And so the, uh, they have a very funny theology. Uh, so it's that uh, Christ didn't finish the job. Uh, and in particular, he, what he didn't do was to get married. Okay? And so what uh, the Reverend Moon, this is the leader of the, of the sect, does is, first of all, he got married, and now he's getting everybody else to get married. And in particular, he's marrying everybody completely randomly. Because the important thing is to get married and not to be stuck with uh, racial presuppositions and so on. Reverend Moon, he is from South Korea, and he has a South Korean wife, but he insists very much that uh, Frenchmen hire, uh, marry Eskimos and uh, Russians, uh, people from South Africa, and Americans, people, uh, Aborigines, and, and so on. So everything has to be mixed. And they meet once a year in a big football stadium, 80,000 people and something, and then they call up the, the new couples and discover themselves. Yeah. So this is... Uh, uh, about as far as I've ever, ever seen the, the one guru guy directing the lives of everybody else on a, in a completely voluntary setting because he doesn't have a stick. I didn't see the stick. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, clearly this is limited. Right? This is the charismatic uh, sect leader. Right? This is a limited impact. Uh, the uh, collectivist decision-making, um, the producer cooperative, is also limited. Uh, most of you will get married one day, uh, also you have observed your parents uh, making collective decisions with two persons, okay? And so you know that this is far from being obvious, okay? <laughs> Getting to a common opinion, right? I mean, if it's already, I mean, look at the divorce rates. Right? It seems to be impossible to get uh, common ground with two people for any extended period of time. Now, how can we imagine that this should be possible with a co producer cooperative involving not only whatever two, but five or ten, but five thousand or five million or five billion people? This is completely out of the question. Right? It's out of the question. So the only thing that remains then is cooperation through the market or coordination through the market process. And people cooperate meaningfully with one another; that they are uh, complementary. Their activities are complementary to one another being steered by market prices. I work for this guy because he pays me a high salary and offers nice working conditions. I get the best package from him, get the highest price. Therefore, I work from him. Why is he able to offer me the best price? Well, because consumers pay the highest price for his products. 
Why do consumers pay the highest prices for his products? Well, because his products are better in their eyes than all the other things on which they could also spend their money. Right? So there is a coordination, right? complementarity, a human cooperation arranged, steered by spontaneously. It's not one single individual who makes decisions for everybody or one gremium, one, one council that makes uh, decisions for everybody else. But people are led to cooperate by the incentives coming through the pricing process. Right? So this is a very short summary of what this is all about. And, you should, well, so listen carefully to the following lectures in which still this will be explained in more detail. Uh, flippant question and a more serious question. The flippant question is, do you think the problems in market relationships, uh, if it's, it's a system of barter and an efficient, uh, they don't come the money? Yeah. And a more serious question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> more serious question is, I know you didn't want to treat the monetary aspects of saving mm -hmm. in this lecture. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me um, what you have to re-ask what is saved, what, are, what is being saved to the goods. Mm -hmm. Now, when you add money into the picture, someone who saves money, isn't, in what sense are they saving goods? Well, doesn't it depend upon an ongoing process of production and something yeah. mm -hmm. to allow monetary savings? Yeah, to, yeah. To right. right. So this is, I, I answer the letter question first. Uh, so, indeed, this is one of the modifi modification that comes uh, into this process through the presence of money. Right? It's not the case that we are simply uh, in, in a, in a uh, market economy that we are stockpiling the goods, like Crusoe, right? He's stockpiling fishes or apples, and then he's living off this, or he's digging his little hole in the ground and eating one fish out of, like Smeagol, right? After, <laughs> the other. Uh, but, but rather, what, what is happening is that uh, you have an ongoing production process uh, in which the, the relative weights between uh, producer good uh, uh, production and consumer good uh, production change constantly, but need to be coordinated because they are interdependent. So it gets more complicated, but the basic uh, process re still remains the same. <laughs> and then, of course, okay, the flip and first question. Yeah, I mean, it's a very nice suggestion. I will propose this to my wife, so it's about one euro a kiss or something. Uh, <laughs> Well, debt, no, I mean, debt is, is not something different, but savings debt is a particular way of transferring uh, monetary resources from one end of the economy to another. And, uh, if you have an economy in which no money creation takes place, that operates with a constant money supply, right, then, then debt means that some people give a credit to other people. So the money that they could have used is transferred to other people that now can use it. So this, there's no net increase of savings. As simple as a debt or credit is a particular way of using savings or of channeling savings from one um, uh, individual to another. So it's part of the division of financial labor, if you wish. Right. Okay. So it's not something uh, separate. And then, of course, the other question is: uh, Can we? Uh, the, the, the real question is: Can we substitute uh, money production for savings? Do we have? to renounce to something uh, in order to save more, in order to, to spend more on uh, production processes, on investment projects, or can we not simply create all the money that we need? And we, we print all the money, so I mean, we consume just as much as before or even more. Now we print more money and can invest, therefore, on top of this. And this is not uh, possible. Right? It's one of the points of the Austrian theory of, uh, of the business cycle uh, to show this. Right? And ultimate, the ultimate reason is that um, it must be savings in real terms. Right? So you need to have a reduction of co consumer expenditure, of co consumption, uh, of consumer goods, actually. Mm. Even, if that, even if that transfer of wealth from one sector to another, mm -hmm. uh, via debt, uh, goes to like a, a very confident entrepreneur and actually uses that debt to invest in something that turns out to be high. Yeah, of course. This is, this is one of the reasons why a debt exists in the first place. Right? So because people, you have been saved first. Exactly. You can only give this as a, as a credit what has been saved first by your, yourself. You can only go into debt to the extent that another guy renounces to his revenue income. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>